The book has three parts. The first two parts are history. And the third part is what I would describe as policy recommendations based on the lessons that can be learned from the history laid out in the first two parts of the book. So the first part of the book is a history of the Fed from essentially from the time it was created and went, uh, began operation in 19, 1914 up until, up until the present. And it's not a typical history of the Fed. There really aren't that many histories of the Fed, surprisingly. But most of them t describe what this Fed chairman said or what that Fed chairman did or when they increased interest rates. That's not what my book does. It tells the history of the Fed by tracing the evolution of the Fed's balance sheet through roughly 10 consecutive periods from the beginning until now. And changes in the liability side of the Fed's balance sheet, that shows you precisely how the Fed created money. And changes on the asset side show you precisely what the Fed did with the money that it created. So by tracing changes in the liabilities and assets of the Fed during these uh, 10, 10 key periods of US history, it shows you how the Fed developed new processes and new techniques for essentially uh, managing monetary policy and helping to manage the economy uh, during different periods, very frequently in response to crises such as World War I, which occurred immediately after the Fed uh, opened its doors in 1914, and World War II. And it shows you the Fed's mistakes during the Great Depression, they, uh, why they didn't, were unable to prevent or failed to prevent the Great Depression. It shows you the diminishing role of gold decade by decade. And it shows you what the Fed has done subsequently, for instance, in response to the crisis of 2008, and more recently in response to the crisis, uh, the COVID crisis. By creating a lot of money, it's kept us from falling into a new Great Depression. So if anyone wants to understand the, the Federal Reserve, which is now the world's most powerful economic institution, and the United States government's most effective policy tool, if you want to understand the Fed, read part one of this book and you will. It tells you how the Fed works. It tells you all, most of the difficulty in understanding the Fed is just understanding the, the jargon that's typically used to discuss what the Fed does. But part one spells all, this, all of this out in you know, everyday language and, and it will give you a very comprehensive understanding of how the Fed works today and its entire history. So that's part one, is the history of the Fed. Part two, is you could say the history of credit over the, the last, let's say go, going back r roughly to 1950, and especially after dollars ceased to be backed by gold in 1968. As I mentioned earlier in the conversation, this caused our economy to evolve into a different kind of economic system driven by credit growth. Now, no one planned this. This isn't like some evil conspirators in Washington sat behind closed doors and discussed how to addict the economy to credit. This just evolved in the course of events. When there were no longer any limits uh, constraining how much money the Fed could create, these things just changed. Uh, and also there were changes in, in laws. For instance, over time, the required reserve ratio, how many liquidity reserves the banks were required to hold relative to their deposits, Congress reduced that steadily uh, decade after decade. Until today, there are no reserve requirements at all. And so as the reserve requirements went down, that allowed the, the, the banks to create more and more credit through the system of fractional reserve banking. So part two is the history of credit and the, the history of creditism, if you will, how the uh, credit became the most important driver of economic growth. And one very important lesson from that is that any time credit in the United States grows by less than 2% adjusted for inflation, the U.S. goes into recession. So that's happened nine times between 1952 and uh, 2009 at the time of the economic crisis. Every time credit grew by less than 2%, the U.S. went into recession, and the recession didn't end until there was another big surge of credit creation.
So what this tells us is that our economic system now must have credit growth to stay out of recession or and if credit contracts, it will collapse into a depression. So that's the main takeaway from part two, I would say, is in this history of creditism, it shows us that our economy is addicted to credit and it uh, has to have credit growth to stay out of recession. So then part three is called the future. What do we, you know, we study history in order to uh, have a, more knowledge so that we can understand the present and hopefully put in place policies to make the future better. And the lessons that I think we can draw from the last 100 years of the history of money and the history of credit in the United States and how they have evolved is that this new economic system, creditism, it creates both unprecedented problems and unprecedented opportunities. The problem is it, creditism requires credit growth to stay out of crisis. However, the opportunity is that it also gives the, the government now unprecedented, the unprecedented po possibility of investing in new industries and new technologies on a very large scale. So, for example, think about the crisis of 2008. The government responded to that crisis by having trillion dollar budget deficits four years in a row. And the Fed helped out with three rounds of quantitative easing, creating $3.6 trillion to help finance the government borrowing and the government spending that stimulated the economy. At one point in 2009, the Fed's the money supply growth, in other words, representing how much money the, the Fed created, money supply growth peaked at 110% year on year in 2009. In World War II, it only peaked at about 20%. So the money supply growth was five times more in 2009 than it was at the peak of World War II. But the inflation rate peaked a couple of years later at only 3.8% in 2011. And a few years after that, in early, by early 2015, there was deflation again in the US. The CPI was negative in the first months of 2015. So what should we learn from that? Well, we, what we can learn is that it is possible for the US government to spend on a very large scale and for the Fed to create money on a very large scale without this leading to very high rates of inflation. Are we seeing, you know, obviously we are in the middle, we, we have quite a bit of inflation right now. Um, right. Tell me, tell me why that, you know, your thesis uh, survives that um, big bump here. Because, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, chickens coming home to roost, so to speak, at this point. Right. Well, of course, you're, you're exactly right. This, um, this situation we have now certainly creates challenges for my thesis. But I think we have a very clear example. Right now, the, the waters are very muddied, if you will, because of COVID and then now the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It makes this experiment difficult. Is it because do we have inflation now because the government spend too much money because the Fed printed too much money? Or is it because they're a global supply chain bottlenecks? And because Russia's just started a war in Europe that's pushed wheat prices and oil prices and metal prices up to shockingly high levels. Now, I think um, it's mostly the latter. But we have another experiment, an experiment that I described earlier where we have only one force at play uh, the, the government, that's 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, the policy response to the 2008 crisis, where, as I mentioned, money supply growth peaked at 110% one year, and the inflation rate was only 3.8%. Now, this time, the money supply growth during this crisis peaked at less than half that rate. It was only about 55% money supply growth at the peak uh, in 2020 or, or early 2021. And so we have much less money supply growth this time than we did in 2009, but we have much higher rates of inflation. So I, I believe 
that it is the disruption in the global supply chain that has caused most of this in- inflation. Although, although you know, Richard, just to be to play devil's advocate for a moment, I think we had six and a half percent inflation uh, for over a year before the war started, right? Right, and we but we'd had COVID disrupting global supply chain. So the first blow was COVID. COVID started right in early 2020. And at first, it caused deflation. Everybody was locked locked in at home, and um, prices fell. Then, suddenly, we discovered that there were not enough semiconductors in the world. And so new car prices shot up, and used car prices shot up 40% year on year. And in the second quarter of last year, when the inflation was at its highest, at least thus far, the, the spike in used car prices was responsible for one third of all of the inflation in the second quarter. Now, we also have found that there's a shortage of shipping and there's uh, all kinds of shortages. Now, had this war not occurred, it seems likely, but not certain, it seems likely that these global supply chain bottlenecks would have dissipated uh, in the coming months. That is what the Fed expected. That is what most economists expected. That was the reasonable thing to expect. The world would return to normal. If there was a shortage of semiconductors, people would make more semiconductors like they've always done in the past and the prices would come back down. That seemed like a very reasonable assumption. But of course, it wasn't certain because we don't know if there's going to be another wave of COVID. First, we had the COVID 1.0 and then we had Delta and we had Omicron, and we don't know if this is the end or not. And, and as you know, I live in Asia, and it's a concern because now Hong Kong had a zero COVID policy, just like China, uh, but Omicron got into Hong Kong, and now one million people have caught um, COVID because of Omicron. One, there are only seven and a half million people in Hong Kong, and it's now getting loose in China. And if it spreads through China, is China has a zero COVID policy. If they begin shutting down their cities, then we're going to see another huge wave global supply chain disruption as a result of COVID spreading through China. They've already shut down Shenzhen for one week, um, causing all kinds of global supply chain problems. And they could shut down you know, another 50 cities to keep COVID from spreading. So we don't know how long this is going to go on and how long COVID is going to continue disrupting the supply chains. But trying to be optimistic and under the assumption that COVID will fade out, hopefully this year, it was reasonable to assume that the global supply chain would return to normal and inflation would, you know, globalization would resume and prices would once again be back at their normal levels and would be back in a world where globalization puts down strong downward pressure on wages and prices just as we were before. So getting back to the book, that given given the, the assumptions that you that you laid out, specifically, you know, the globalization ultimately creating some overall deflationary pressures, the remedy that you suggested for for some of the issues that the US uh, is facing right now is a fairly significant investment program. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, just let me wrap up a bit more on the inflation side. The proposals that I make in this book are based on the assumption that globalization persists. Now, if globalization breaks down, then that's another matter altogether. And COVID was a very severe blow to globalization and followed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which was another very severe blow to globalization. So just when it looked like COVID was going to fade out and global supply chain disruptions would disappear and prices would begin to, to, inflation would start to go away, then another blow, Russia invades the Ukraine and drives up all the commodity prices to very high levels and creates new and different kinds of supply chain disruptions. So we don't know how long this is going to go on or how severe it will be. Hopefully it will go away soon, but it could become much worse. So. That's the issue. Globalization is now under siege. If it breaks down, then that creates a totally different environment for us. But under the assumption that the world goes back to normal at some point in the not too distant future, then 
I believe that we have a tremendous opportunity for the U.S. government. So here's what I'm proposing in the book. It's, the book is called The Money Revolution, How to Finance the Next American Century, How to Pay for the Next American Century. And we can do this by the U.S. government funding a multi-trillion dollar investment program in the industries of the future over the next 10 years, not this year, over a 10 year period or whenever globalization makes this possible again. And what I'm proposing is a multi-trillion dollar investment in ind industries like artificial intelligence, uh, neural sciences, genetic engineering, biotech, nanotech, robotics, and green energy, uh, renewable energy. All of the, industry, you know, the usual things that come to mind when you think of future technologies. We have the possibility to do this on a, such a large scale. Just think that in the second quarter of 2020, the US government borrowed $2.5 trillion in just three months. And the Fed effectively financed about 80% of that by creating money. So that gives you some idea of the amount of money that the government has at its disposal to invest in new industries and technologies. I really believe that if we do invest on a multi-trillion dollar scale over a 10 year period, we could cure all the diseases. We could radically expand life expectancy. We could turbocharge US economic growth and productivity, create unprecedented wealth and greatly enhance human well-being and not least of all, shore up U.S. national security uh, in, the, the in the face of a gr growing threat from China, frankly, and Russia, as we now see. So I think this is, creates an extraordinary opportunity. So in the book, I don't put a particular number on how much the government should invest. What I recommend is that the government invest as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And if the investment turns out to overheat the economy and cause too much inflation, then they can slow it down until the bottlenecks that are causing the inflation are overcome, as they always are. And they can reaccelerate the program. But for instance, just to provide some example of how this would impact the, the size of the budget deficit and US government debt, I use the example of the government could invest, this is just for the sake of an example, if the government invests $10 trillion over a 10-year 10, 10 period, then in the book, I show how this would impact U.S. government debt. Now, 10 years out, making and here's my assumption, just to make this a very conservative forecast. In my projections, I assume that this $10 trillion investment over 10 years just for the sake of uh, making a pessimistic assumption, I assume that every last penny is wasted, that nothing good comes from this whatsoever, that the GDP doesn't grow, no new technologies are created, nothing positive happens. $10 trillion is just washed down the, the sink and nothing good comes from that. In that scenario, the, the ridiculously pessimistic scenario, then the government's debt 10 years from now would be 150% of GDP instead of 120% of GDP, which is it is expected to be by the Congressional Budget Office 10 years from now. So it'd be 150% of GDP instead of 120% of GDP. Japan's level of government debt now is 260% of GDP. So 10 years from now, in the assumption where every last penny is wasted of this investment program, US government debt at 150% of GDP would be where Japanese government debt to GDP was 20 years ago. One question that um, obviously, you know, sort of killed Build Back Better a little bit uh, was the issue of how to finance it. And if we, you know, you were talking a little bit offline that the timing of your of this book is not ideal in the sense that right now there's not a whole lot of appetite for any kind of spending do you want hey, to well, let me jump in yeah. let me jump yeah. in right there actually the timing the inflation is certainly a problem for this book at the but on the other hand people you know, buck you and i have been discussing these issues for a few years now and you and other people have sometimes suggested 
that what I'm proposing is the government's just never going to do anything like that, many people have said. But in fact, this is already beginning to be implemented. Just two months ago, Congress, the House of Representatives, passed the America Competes Act, allocating $350 billion for investment in new industries and technologies, including $52 billion specifically for the semiconductor industry to make more semiconductors in the United States. And this follows on a bill that was passed last year in the Senate that was called the United States Innovation and Competition Act, which allocated $250 billion for investment in the industries and technologies of the future, uh, including also $52 billion for investment in U.S. semiconductor manufacturing. So this is exactly what I've been calling for for a very long time, for a very large scale government funded investment program targeting the industries of the future. And now both the House and the Senate have passed these laws. They have to go through the reconciliation process and then they'll be signed into law by, by the president. So this is beginning to happen and, uh, because they have finally realized first, well, a few things, it's not good to be reliant on other countries for semiconductors. But also a lot of this is driven by the, the realization that because China, China's government invests so much more than the United States does in research and development, that they're overtaking us technologically and therefore will soon overtake us economically and militarily. That's why they have hypersonic missiles and 5G and the United States doesn't. So, so how, would, how are they financing this stuff and how would they continue you know, on a much larger scale as you're suggesting, how would it be financed? So how they're financing this, um, since it will be something that will begin to be implemented either later this year or next year, they'll finance it the way they always finance their spending through uh, deficit spending to some extent, or they haven't specified how they would finance it, which means it will result in the budget deficit being higher than it would have been otherwise, which will mean they will borrow more. And we don't know how much of, the, of this will be financed by the Fed. Up until this month, the Fed was creating $120 billion every month, and they were using two thirds of that to buy government bonds, which helped finance everything the government spent. But now as of this month, they're not creating any money, any new money at all. So assuming that they don't reverse course, then it will just result in the government borrowing more. But of course, the government borrowing peaked last year. What was it? Government borrowing last uh, in, tw in 2020, two years ago, gov government borrowing increased by $4.6 trillion. Last year, it increased by $1.7 trillion. So there was a very big drop in how much the government borrowed last year. And it's expected to be lower again this year. The Congressional Budget Office is expecting the government to borrow $1.1 trillion this year. So, you know, of course, this will not all be spent in one year, this bill that they have just passed, this law, these laws I described. It will be spread out over several years. And, but as it's spent, then it would add to the level of the government's budget deficits, unless some other change is made. Now, what I'm proposing in this uh, multi-trillion dollar plan over a 10-year period is for the Fed to finance it all. In other words, the government borrows the money by selling government bonds. Uh, let's say, sticking with my example, $10 trillion over 10 years, the government sells, you know, it starts off slowly uh, and then builds up. You can't just have a $1 trillion investment in the first year, for instance. You have to hire people, you have to make plans. So gradually they start the borrowing at a, at a slower rate and then accelerate it going forward over the 10 year period. So the government sells bonds and the Fed creates money through quantitative easing and buys all the bonds, just like it has been doing through COVID. The government's borrowing related to COVID was roughly in something like $5 trillion. And the Fed created $4 trillion to help finance that government borrowing. So the Fed effectively financed 80% of the government's borrowing during COVID. And during the crisis of 2008, during the three rounds of quantitative easing, the Fed created some roughly enough to finance 70% of the government's borrowing.
So what I'm proposing is the Fed just create money by all of these government bonds and um, finance it that way through money creation. And if 2008 is the best model to follow, then I believe they can do that without causing high rates of inflation. Because as I said, in the money supply growth was 110%. In other words, the size of the Fed's total assets more than doubled in 2009, and the inflation rate only went up to 3.8%. So we talked a little earlier offline about who, you know, who, who it is that you're writing this book for. And it's really, you know, as much as uh, it's useful for sure for, you know, people like me, the goal here is to really persuade general, you know, not only the general public, but academics and policymakers as well. Have you had a, have you had it any sense of what kind of feedback you're getting from those policymakers and academics on, and on the work? So I haven't really officially launched the book yet. That's, um, that's you're one of the first people. Ah, I got it before the policy makers say. <laughs> you're one of the first people uh, I've spoken with in detail about the book. But the official launch is coming in the next couple of weeks, and then there'll be press press release and social media marketing campaign. And so hopefully it will reach these people and in terms of policymakers, encourage them to do even more of what they've begun to do, which is pass laws to invest in new industries and technologies on a very, very large scale. The, um, the book, I presume, will be available in all the usual um, Amazon and, and the usual places people buy books. Yes, it is available now. Uh, it's, so I hope your listeners will go to their favorite bookstore or Amazon and and buy the book. It's um, 500 pages and it has 250 charts. Well, if anybody's, if, if uh, general public people are going to read it, it's going to be this audience because they are pretty smart people who are very inquisitive. Uh, the book is called The Money Revolution, How to Finance the Next American Century. In addition to that, um, tell us a little bit and remind us a little bit about Macro Watch, Richard. Well, so, Buck, let me tell you three reasons why I think this investment is so urgently required. First, as, as we discussed earlier, our economic system must have credit growth to stay out of crisis. And the private sector is so heavily indebted now that they, they can't keep borrowing at this scale. And so that only means we're dependent on government borrowing. There, there's no limit as to how much, there are effectively no limit as to how much the government to borrow, can borrow. So this sort of investment program that I'm describing, the government borrowing would, would keep credit expanding and keep the economy out of crisis. So that's the first reason. Creditism must have credit growth to survive. The second reason, is also something we've touched on. We're about to be overtaken by China. China's investing more than the United States is in research and development, and they're about to overtake us technologically, economically, and therefore militarily. We do not want to be at China's mercy. If they develop artificial intelligence before the United States does, the way that they've developed 5G and hypersonic missiles before the United States has, then if they get to the level of artificial intelligence where the machines are as intelligent as humans, then that increases exponentially after that point, and they become the global dominant superpower. And the United States becomes a vulnerable, second-rate, has-been power at China's mercy, and along with the rest of the world. It will be China's world. They'll make the decisions. They'll decide whether there's free press or not or individual liberties. Uh, it will be a, it will be something like the 21st century equivalent to China having a nuclear weapons monopoly. We don't we don't have to allow that to happen. Do you feel like the you know members of Congress um, have that message, have that understanding already? Yes, that's the main reason they have passed these two acts that I I described earlier: America Competes and the Innovation and Competition Act. Um, more than about two years ago, uh, Chuck Schumer um, made up the, the majority leader in the Senate. He was in minority leader. He's, he made a speech before the military establishment in Washington stating exactly this. We have to invest in new industries and technologies because China is going to overtake us. In President uh, Biden's state of the uh, inaugural address, he said 
He said that almost that exactly. We have to invest more in new industries and technologies because China is going to overtake us. And that's exactly right. This is our new Sputnik moment. If we don't invest, we're going to lose and we may never be able to catch up with China. So that's the second reason that this investment is so urgently necessary. And the third reason, and I think this is the most important and most compelling is I think we must invest because we can so easily afford to do this. It's we can, as I show in the book in great detail, we can easily afford to invest on this sort of scale. And if we do, it would create such extraordinary breakthroughs at all levels. It would induce a new technological revolution. It would radically in, improve human well-being. As I said before, I really believe we have a chance to cure all the diseases and radically expand life expectancy. Right now, the National Cancer Institute, its budget is $6 billion a year, and 600,000 Americans are dying of cancer every year. $6 billion a year. That's all they get. Quantitative easing was $120 billion every month. So just imagine how radically we could expand the National Cancer Institute's budget, for instance, and also those institutes charged with curing Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, kidney disease, uh, and other diseases. We have the potential to invest many multiples of what we're investing now to cure these diseases. And if we do, we'll cure them in our own lifetime. And you know that's just that's just health. We also have the opportunity to um, stop the environmental deg degradation, for instance. But furthermore, this kind of investment would just turbocharge economic growth. You know, in my example, I, I assume that nothing good whatsoever would happen from this, just to be the most pessimistic possible. But that's so untrue. The economy would grow very, very rapidly. It would create extraordinary amounts of new wealth. The wealthy people would become wealthy and healthy beyond their wildest dreams, and everyone else would be as well. This would permeate through American society. And furthermore, not just U.S. society, but this would be beneficial to everyone in the world as we cure these diseases, for instance. So I call it a moral imperative. We must invest because we can so easily afford to do this. And in this book, I demonstrate that it is something that the Americans can easily afford to do. So that's the third reason. That's why we have to make this investment. Well, let's uh, let's hope you're right and hope uh, you convince some people here, Richard. Again, the book is The Money Revolution, How to Finance the Next American Century. And um, also tell us a little bit about uh, MacroWatch as well, because that's a great resource for uh, listeners as well. Thank you, Buck, for letting me mention MacroWatch. MacroWatch is my business. Every couple of weeks, I upload a new video so MacroWatch is a video newsletter, and my videos are PowerPoint presentations with audio in which I describe something important happening in the global economy and how that's likely to affect asset prices. So the last one came out just before the Federal Reserve met for the FOMC meeting last week. It was called Fear the Fed, and I explained why the Fed is likely to have to become very aggressive and tightening monetary policy now because of the high rates of inflation and why that's likely to push downward pressure on asset prices, particularly since asset prices are so stretched at the moment. So those are the sorts of topics that I discuss. There are 75 hours of videos now, more than 75 hours going back eight years in which I have discussed all the major developments in the global economy since then. So anyone subscribed who subscribes to MacroWatch will get one new video every couple of weeks and also have immediate access to all of the videos in the archives. So I hope your listeners will check it out. They can find MacroWatch on my website at richardduncaneconomics.com. That's richardduncaneconomics.com. And they can subscribe at a 50% discount if they use the coupon code, so if they click the subscribe now button, they'll be prompted to put in a discount coupon code. They can subscribe at a 50% discount. So I hope they'll check that out. Richard, thank you so much again for being a Wealth Formula podcast and uh, uh, look forward to talking to you in the next few months uh, to, to get further feedback on where we're headed. 